Labor is the number one reason for construction cost blowouts. And it's simply because labor costs are very difficult to accurately calculate. Materials and subcontractors are easy. Measure what you need, get quotes, and then put them into your estimate. Plants is usually a tiny portion of the project cost and is actually driven by labor. But labor costs, now you're dealing with HR agreements, measuring quantities, determining accurate productivity rates, working out non-productive time, and a hundred other factors. Get any of these factors wrong and you'll either underquote and lose money on the project or overquote and not win it. So in this video, I'm going to show you exactly how to accurately estimate construction labor costs. We're going to go through rate buildups and accurately calculating cost recovery rates determining non-productive times, production versus program-driven tasks, productivity-based estimates, and how to determine task productivity, and also a program-based labor estimate. I learned how important and difficult calculating labor costs were firsthand when working on a major oil and gas construction project. It was completely cost-reimbursable, but we lost our profit margin if we overran the budget, so we still had to accurately come up with a cost to complete. The client was free issuing all the key materials, so the project costs were 80% driven by labor. So we had to set an accurate budget or we were gonna be doing the project for free. But we made some major mistakes in our pricing. We didn't factor in travel time to site. We had to close the main car park to store materials and because of this, we had to ferry workers from the offset car park, the existing car park, which ended up taking almost half an hour each way. Because the methodology was our risk, the client said that that additional travel time should have been covered in our labor rates. On top of that, we had an error in our spreadsheet on a key production rate. So what we were charging per unit installed ended up being too low. And even though some major things went our way, we got some key variations, some increases in the quantity of work, we couldn't even recover the cost for the additional work because our labor rate was wrong and our production rate was wrong. And basically we lost money on variations, which you should never do. This was the first time in my career I'd seen firsthand the compounding effect of labor buildups. Think about it, with every single labor rate, you have three dependent variables. You have the cost rate, the productivity rate, and the quantity of work. That's three different places that your labor estimate can go wrong. On top of that, often your pricing at tender will be used as the basis for any variations. Most of the variations you'll get will be largely driven by labor. So if your pricing at tender is bad, it's even more difficult to accurately get change orders approved with a healthy margin. So that's why labor isn't just the biggest cost on a construction project, it's also the one with the most uncertainty and risk associated with it and why you need to do a very good job of calculating it properly. Okay, so how does calculating labor costs actually work? Well, surprise, surprise, it's a combination of two key things. The labor cost rate you come up with, the number of hours you need to budget for on your project, which gives you the total labor cost. Now, there's two ways this can be wrong. Well, theoretically three, if you factor in that the hours are a function of productivity and quantity. Really, you can either have the rate wrong or you can have the total hours wrong. The total hours being a combination of the task activity and the quantity of work. Now, through this video and what I'm gonna discuss, the goal is for you to understand the process, not to copy the numbers because what happens with labor and what's so confusing about it is it's a function of so many different things that it's very easy to either double count, duplicate things, or miss items. So first off, let's talk about how to accurately come up with the labor rate, and then we'll go on to coming up with the total man hours. So the first part of this is all gonna be about calculating the labor rate. The labor rate is what one person costs per productive hour. So what does someone working on a specific task cost the business per hour. That's what we need to recover in the labor rate. This is gonna be a combination of the salary, the on costing, and the ratio of the productive and the non-productive time. But as you see, it's a little bit more complicated than that. That's why it's so essential that you understand the process and where the numbers you're using are coming from so you're not double counting things. Now, the salary is what someone is paid for an hour 
the thrower works. So if someone gets paid $50 an hour, their salary is $50 an hour. Salary is pretty easy to understand, but what they cost the business is different to their salary because on top of this salary, or whatever they cost the business for one hour to do the work, we have to factor in annually, sick leave, public holidays, superannuation, payroll tax, allowances like PPE, consumables, as well as hiring and recruitment costs. So what this basically means is while someone gets paid $50 an hour, that's what goes into their bank account for one hour of work, what they really end up charging the business is probably more like 35 to 40% more than that. Again, and this is referred to as the loaded cost rate in some of the work. So for example, if we factor in, so this is an example from a spreadsheet. I'll put a link to you can download free in the video description. If we factor in 8% for annual leave, which is four weeks of annual leave a year out of 52 weeks, public holidays, two weeks per year, which is 4%, sick leave, which is another two weeks per year, superannuation of 11%, workers' compensation of 4%, payroll tax of 6%, we actually end up with an on-cost percentage of 36%. So if we, the other example I was using was 38, I should have made those numbers the same. We end up with the cost of that person is $69 per hour to the business. The true cost per hour on the project is significantly more than their salary because we've got to factor in all these additional costs. Now, you'll see in this calculation spreadsheet, this is based on 38 hours per, 38 hours per week. So. Oh, sorry, I should have mentioned before, I skipped over this bit. You have also have to factor in the working week. So are they working purely normal time or are they doing a bit of overtime? How many overtime hours they're doing? Generally, I like to work out the salary per week then just divide it by the number of hours they're working. So if they're working 38 hours, 40 hours, whatever your normal week is, it'll just be the base rate. But if they're working some overtime rates, I would calculate the overall salary per week. But if they're working... If they're at work 60 hours a week, 38 hours, whatever, are they actually doing productive work that entire time? Well, the answer is no. They have pre-starts, toolbox talks, morning tea, lunch breaks. They have to walk to site, away from site. They have to pack up their equipment, get set up for tasks, move between tasks. All of these things impact the number of productive hours they work. Now, here's where things start to get a little bit confusing and why this part at the start, I really want to stress where it's understanding the process, not copying the numbers. But you need to understand when we talk about applying a productivity rate to this cost is some people will include in their productivity rate, non-productive time. Some people won't include it. So there's two ways we can measure productivity for a task. We can use the stopwatch, met the stopwatch method, which is purely the task productivity. So it excludes breaks, meetings, setup, and waiting looks faster on paper, but you need to factor in non-productive time. So the stopwatch method is if someone's putting up form work, you stand there with a stopwatch and measure how long it takes them to put up a meter squared. If it takes two hours, that productivity is two man hours per meter squared, but it doesn't include any non-productive time. Now, the other way to measure productivity is you take the output of a crew or an individual per week divide it by the total number of hours that they've worked per week. This is the method that makes way more sense to me and I think is way less error prone because you know what? It includes non-productive time in that. So the productivity rate includes non-productive time. So say a four-person crew puts up 80 meters squared of form work. They each worked 40 hours per week. The production rate you would get is two man hours per meter squared, but this already has non-productive time baked into it. It's factoring in, setting up, packing up, putting rubbish in the bin, lunch breaks, all that stuff. That's why I prefer and it makes way more sense to me that you do your productivity rates like this based on what a group of people get done in a week. You take the average of that, you'll come up with a more reasonable production rate with non-productive time already baked into it. Now, some people would criticize this method to say that different jobs have different non-productive times and to a certain degree, that's correct. But usually lunch breaks, spoko breaks, all those things tend to be the same job to job with a little bit of variability. I think the stopwatch method is too specific and increases the risk that you undercook your productivities because you have to factor in every single step of the process and all that's gonna happen is you're gonna miss things. So I think this method makes a lot more sense to me and you're taking the average of a group of people. But if you do use the stopwatch method for your task, you'll need to 
adjust for or include non-productive time on this. So for example, if you work out that on an eight hour workday, they're only on site being productive 6.5 hours per day, you can either adjust the productivity or adjust the rate to get a productive rate. So for this example, you could times the rate of $69, the uncosted loaded rate by eight on 6.5, which gives you $85 an hour, which is the rate you would need to apply to that productivity. However, again, if you're using the weekly crew output, you don't need to factor in non-productive time. So that's how we come up with our cost recovery rate. And I don't know if I made this too confusing. You just really have to understand how your productivity rates are calculated and what's baked into them. Because if you do double count non-productive time, you'll increase your price a lot. If you don't include it, you'll undercook your productivities. That's why, again, I prefer the weekly method. But the next question we need to answer is how many hours do we, of work do we need to budget for on our project? And this is a very simple process. We build a work breakdown structure, take the project scope, break it down into tasks, decide whether task is production-based or program-based. I'm going to explain these terms in a second. We then measure the quantity of work associated with each task and then apply a productivity rate or duration, depending on whether it's a production-based task or a program-based task. So the first step in this process is we need to create a project work breakdown structure. To do this, we wanna break the overall project scope down into a series of tasks. And the only way we can do this is by deconstructing and understanding the scope and drawings. We filter by layers. So we take the project scope and we put it into a hierarchical decomposition. All this means, it's a fancy way of saying, we take the scope and we break it into smaller and smaller pieces until the, the level of detail I like to go to is each task should have one clear combination of labor, plant, materials, or subcontractors per task driven by a single productivity rate. So for example, you could take a construction project, you could break it down into foundations, structure, fit out, external works, and landscaping. Then within foundations, you break it into the separate slabs. And then again, again, each slab, you have a combination of concrete works and productivities. This structure, the work breakdown structure, I think is one of the most important concepts in construction projects management. And it is the structure we use to drive our estimates, our schedules, cost control, and our quality and procurement. So if I go through and show you a quick example from Operum, my estimating software of what this would look like for a commercial construction project, this breakdown is the same breakdown we're going to be using for labor, plant materials, whatever. But basically we've taken, it's this is a commercial construction project example. We've broken it down into earthworks, concrete, building structure, services, finishes, external works. And under each of these pricing items, we have a worksheet with our labor calculations, but also our materials, subcontractor and plant calculations. Now, for us to accurately determine the hours we need to allocate to that task, the next thing we need to work out, is it a production-based task or is it a program-based task? Production-based task means the quantity of work drives the durations. It means you're doing a task where there's no constraints, you have clear access, and the total hours we need for the task is directly proportional to the volume of work you have to do. For example, you have a civil crew, they can trench 50 meters per day. There's a thousand meters of trenching to do. The, the hours for that task is going to be the civil crew for the 20 days. The other type of task we can have is a program-based task where there's some other sort of bottleneck that is determining the duration of task takes. So say for example, we have that same civil crew, they can trench and backfill 50 meters per day, but we're installing some underground welded pipe and the pipe install crew can only do 30 meters per day. That means the civil crew is limited by the speed that the pipe install crew is going. So they can't actually do more than 30 meters of trenching and backfill per day. So even though their actual productivity rate would be 50 meters per day, they're limited by the program of the pipe install. So the productivity we would have to use in this is 30 meters per day. So instead of allowing for 20 days for this task, we would need to allow for whatever a thousand by 30 is, which I think is like 33. So the key question to ask, it's, I use the terms production and program based, but you just really need to understand this question. What is driving the duration of the task? The next step in this process is we need to convert the quantity of work 
into man hours. Again, if it's program-based task, you do this off the overall duration of the task. But if it's a quantity-driven task, all we do is take the quantity of work and multiply it by our production rate, assuming you have the units around the right way. Some people get confused and they'll multiply, say divide 100 by divided by two, which would be wrong. You have to pay attention to those units. For example, this form work activity, I'm measuring in the number of hours per meter squared of form work. So if I times by the quantity of form work, I get the number of hours. But some people write productivities as how many meters squared someone could do per hour. So in that example, the, produ the correct production rate would be 0.5. So all you have to do, and then, sorry, and then you divide the quantity by the production rate. Again, pay attention to your numbers. Make sure you have the units around the right way. Again, if it's a program-based task on a production-based task, simply instead of using the production for the task, you use the program constraint. For example, pipe install is 30 meters per day, which gives you the total man hours. So little things to pay attention to is often we talk of like for the formwork example, because it's one person doing formwork, I'm talking about that individual. Often you'll have to do this using a gang rate. So a gang rate would be some combination of resources like labor and plant. So for example, trenching, we might have two laborers and an excavator. So that rate we would use, we would build up the combination of two laborers and excavator, whatever that would cost per hour. And that would be the hour we use. So for example, 50 meters per day, say it's 20 days, that would be 40 man days was we have two laborers. Again, simple concept, but you just have to pay attention that you're accurately calculating all this stuff. Okay, to put it all together, the very complicated formula to finish with, our total labor cost for the project, simply the hourly rate multiplied by the man hours. The maths is easy, making sure that all the input numbers that go into the hourly rate and the man hours, again, is the hard part. So the questions you have to answer before you submit your labor estimate, before you calculate your labor estimate, is do you understand how your labor rate was built up? Have you included the right on cost? Do your productivities include or exclude non-productive time? For each task, did you determine correctly whether it's production or program-based and have you clearly documented your assumptions around this? Again, I can't give you the exact numbers, but this is the process I use to think through my labor estimates to avoid missing scope, double counting, and undercounting.